Orders of the day, oral qu questions put by members to ministers. It is now 3.14. We will finish at 4.43. I will now recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. 4.44. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The amount of money the Premier has spent on marketing the NDP as gender, Mr. Speaker, has many Nova Scotians shaking their heads with this government's priorities. For example, when it comes to public education, the NDP has cut $76 million from the classrooms, Mr. Speaker, resulting in over 700 teacher cuts and wait lists for nearly 2,000 kids across the province to access speech language pathologists and school psychology services. So my question to the Premier, how can the Premier justify, justify cutting tens of millions of dollars from students in this province while he spends tens of thousands of dollars to promote his education ads? The Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, of course, as usual, the preamble is entirely incorrect. Uh, we have not cut that money out of education. And in fact, we spent a great deal of effort time in ensuring that we uh, get the programming in place uh, to deliver the best quality education uh, to uh, students in this province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I can proudly say um, that the per capita funding for students in this province is at its highest level ever in this province. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, this NDP government has cut $76 million out of public education, Mr. Speaker, in this province is the second lowest funding in the entire country when it comes to public education, Mr. Speaker. Meanwhile, Mr. Speaker, between radio ads, TV ads, oh, and those famous promotional lunch bags, Mr. Speaker, this government has spent nearly three quarters of a million dollars on political advertising. So could the Premier please tell this host why he thinks it's more important to do political advertising instead of investing in Nova Scotia children? Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's not true. And I, I would just point out that when the Liberals were in power, we had the worst uh, record of funding education in the country. Uh, and we have been finally making progress on that. When the member uh, for Colchester North was the Minister of Education. We had the worst funding in the country, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and we um, now have increased uh, the per capita funding. And I also want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that at one point in time in this province, we had 216,000 students in P-12. This year, we have 120,000 uh, in, in this province. So there's almost 100,000 students less um, in our public school system. It has been difficult to adjust to that kind of reduction in demand. But we are uh, following a course that is designed to support rural schools, to, to design to support and defend uh, the quality of education in this province and to deliver to the young people of our province the best possible education. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, when the member from Colchester North was the Minister of Education, she invested in Nova Scotia students, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, she didn't ask young people, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, she didn't ask, Mr. Speaker. She didn't ask young people, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, she didn't ask young people, Mr. Speaker, to pay for the political advertising, Mr. Speaker, that that government is doing, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, most recently, Mr. Speaker, most recently, Mr. Speaker. Order, order, please. Order. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition has the floor, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, most recently, the NDP government has spent $139,520 on their fairer power rate ads ads which have no value to anyone outside the NDP election war room. Mr. Speaker, these government ads were quickly followed by very I similar ad advertisements by Amera and Nova Scotia today. Power. Given the cozy relationship between the Premier has with Nova Scotia Power, it should come to no surprise to Nova Scotians that they've teamed up on their advertising buy. So my question to the Premier, did the Premier actually seek approval from the mayor before he aired those adver advertisements? Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the leader of the Liberal Party and the leader of the opposition wants to defend the member for Colchester North, but I think she made those investments when she was actually a Conservative member of the legislature. But let's, but let's remember, let's remember the actual Order, record. order, please, order.
The Honourable Premier has the floor. Let's remember the actual record of the Liberal Party when they were in, when they were in power. First of all, they smashed the collective agreements of the teachers, they fired them, and they ensured that we had one of the worst funding levels with respect to education anywhere, no, the worst, anywhere in the country. But, you know, they didn't have any problem with doing their own ads. They just took the money from their trust funds and they put it into advertising. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And on to more serious topics. In the last four years, full-time employment for young Nova Scotians, those aged 15 to 24, actually dropped by a staggering 12.6 percent, Mr. Speaker, a loss of 4,600 jobs for Nova Scotia young people. And I'll table that seasonally adjusted report from Statistics Canada. That's despite having a government that spent $200 million on their Jobs Here plan and other expensive NDP bailouts and giveaways. Mr. Speaker, there's already talk of elections around here. Young Nova Scotians are voting with their feet. 4,600 of them have lost their jobs in the last four years, and we know where they've gone. They've gone out west. My question for the Premier, how did he manage to spend $200 million and lose 4,600 jobs at the same time? Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, everyone who watched his question period knows that that's not true. And they know that the leader of the Conservative Party simply takes, cherry picks out pieces of Statistics Canada reports that don't reflect the reality of Nova Scotia at all. The people who are careful, watch carefully know that Nova Scotia was the only province in the country to actually have a net gain in jobs in the last uh, year. That, that, that every reporting organization, whether it's Atlantic Provinces uh, Economic Council or whether it is the CIBC World Markets or the Bank of Montreal or any of them, all say the same thing, which is that Nova Scotia's economy has been resilient and that in fact, that in fact, Mr. Speaker, they say that for, finally, after 20 years, the, the 10 years captured by the last Conservative government and, of course, capturing the last Liberal government, after having the worst economic development over all those years, that Nova Scotia is finally poised to turn the corner to a more positive economy, that we are going to move up among the provinces in terms of growth. Mr. Speaker, that is good news. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party on his first supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, perhaps uh, the Premier is beginning to believe his own TV ads, and he's the only one that does. It's time to change the channel back to reality TV, because that same report from Statistics Canada shows that for Nova Scotians in mid-career, full-time employment dropped by 10,600 jobs during his term of office, a drop of 4%. For those in mid-career, Mr. Speaker, that's despite $590 million of corporate welfare borrowed and underwritten by the NDP, a workforce larger than the entire town of Truro, lost in four years, Mr. Speaker. That's the reality of the situation. And those Nova Scotians are also voting with their feet already, because we know where they've gone to find work, and that's also out west. So I will ask the Premier, in the real world, does he understand why so many Nova Scotians have lost their jobs despite all the money he's borrowing and spending here in Nova Scotia? Honourable the Premier. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I know that the leader of the Conservative Party, apparently, I mean, they spent years, uh, of course, doing business cases on the back of, uh, of envelopes and handing out money to fo folks. I know, so he's not, he's, not used, he's not used to seeing a government that actually makes good investments, that makes sure that we actually receive a benefit, that uh, a government that on its loan portfolio has made some $80 million in returns for the people of Nova Scotia. And we know that he's opposed to the 440 jobs predominantly, which will keep young people here in the province to projects. He, he actually 
his, his, him and his members actually stood up and insulted the employer who came to our house to, uh, to talk about the 440 jobs that they were creating. He's opposed to IBM, Mr. Speaker, opening the, the Global Delivery Centre uh, here in Nova Scotia. You know, while, while uh, people were chairing that announcement, Mr. Speaker, so no, no wonder, Mr. Speaker, he doesn't understand uh, what uh, economic development drivers actually look like. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, you know what a good investment is? One that actually creates jobs, not loses 4,600 for our young people and costs 200 million. Nova Scotians aren't interested in what interest rate he's getting on his investment account, which he's lent out to the Irvings, which he's lent out to all these companies. They want to know whether jobs are going up or down. For our young people, they're minus 4,600. For those in mid-career, they're minus 10,600. And I know, Mr. Speaker, that the Premier likes to blame it on the global recession. But you know what? For the rest of Canada, for that exact same time, the labour force grew by over 300,000 jobs. What's unique about Nova Scotia, we have the highest taxes in the whole country, the highest power rates in the whole country. That's his jobs plan, and the return is minus 4,600 jobs for young people. So will the Premier admit that the real reason jobs are being lost is because of his high tax and high power rate policies? Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, just again, so that nobody out there believes that a single word that he has said is true, because none of it is, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we have the lowest business taxes in this province in 20 years. That is the record of this government, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have invested in... Uh, we have invested in Port Hawkesbury paper. We have invested in ensuring that jobs are created in this province through RIM, through IBM, through projects, Mr. Speaker. And he has the, a nerve to call it corporate welfare, Mr. Speaker. But it's not corporate welfare. What he wants is to make sure that people are on real welfare. <laughs> the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. To, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our, our health care system is facing immense pressures escalating cost pressures, public frustration with wait times, and a Harper Conservative government that will fundamentally change the way uh, with funds health care, which will negatively impact Nova Scotia. So, Mr. Speaker, in light of all these pressures, could the Premier explain why ma maintaining 10 CEOs and 90-plus VPs and directors would better, be better adding than putting more money in frontline health care? Honourable the Premier. You don't change that, I don't take my shirt off. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad that he uh, brought up uh, this uh, topic because, in fact, our record in health care administration is one of absolute success. We took a health care administration that had, as a percentage of its budget, some 6.7% going into administration. We've reduced that below the national average. The one thing that we have not done is entered into the uh, extraordinarily wrong-headed idea that somehow that you amalgamate into a gigantic bureaucracy, a, a gigantic bureaucracy that takes away the voice of ordinary Nova Scotians from health care decisions and, and costs more expenses to patient care, because that is the result of what he is proposing. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the only party in this province that could eliminate 10 CEOs making over $200,000, another 90 employees, Mr. Speaker, making over $100,000 and increase the expense would be the NDP party, Mr. Speaker. No other party could meet that feat but that group across there, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we must find a way, Mr. Speaker, we must find a way to allow patients to get their certain... Mr. Speaker, we must find a way to allow patients to get the surgeries faster, enable them, Mr. Speaker, to travel to any health care facility in the province they wish to, even outside of their district. Right now, Mr. Speaker, budget turf protection between the nine administrative boundaries prevents this from happening, Mr. Speaker, as frequently as it could, or quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, as it should. My question to the Premier, does the Premier agree or disagree that we need to find a way to allow patients to travel to any facility in this province that they choose in order to access the health care they need. Honourable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I realize that this is another 
profound example of the inexperience of the leader of the Liberal Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, uh, patients can travel to the various facilities well, they want to to get the service that they want. They can do that now, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Of course they can. But, Mr. Speaker, the rest of us out, out here uh, have, have lived through amalgamations that came about as a result of the Liberal forced Party. Forced amalgamations. We watched forced. the forced amalgamations, and you know something? No money was saved. And, in fact, what happened is more expenses, bigger bureaucracies were, 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 uh, were created, no efficiencies were created, and what happened was that money was taken out of patient care in order to pay more, more bureaucrats. The Liberal Party have done it before, and now, Mr. Speaker, they want to do it again. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, pa patients can travel to any facility in this province. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, we have nine districts who are trying to protect their own turf, Mr. Speaker, and not allowing patients to do that on a regular basis. It's not first option, Mr. Speaker. It's for those Nova Scotians who can find their way through the massive amount of bureaucracy we have in this house get to do that. Ordinary, hard-working Nova Scotians who can't find their way through the massive bureaucracy that is supported by this NDP government have no choice but to languish on wait lists in the districts, Mr. Speaker, where they live, Mr. Speaker. So while this Premier wants to protect the 10 CEOs, we want to give Nova Scotians quicker access to primary health care, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our plan will put decision-making back in the hands of those who know their patients best, our frontline health care workers, Mr. Speaker, and take it out of the boardrooms, Mr. Speaker. Our plan will remove the administrative burden that has been stifling our health care system, Mr. Speaker, and will let once again, Mr. Speaker, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our plan will remove the administrative burden that has been stifling our health care professionals and will let them once again play an integral part in our health care system. My question to the Premier, could the Premier please tell us how allowing health care professionals to get greater access is it going to hurt Nova Scotians? Honourable the Premier. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, first of all, uh, that's exactly what this government is all about. We have smoothed uh, the uh, ability of people to get to move, to move from to move from district to district to get the service that they require, Mr. Speaker, because that's about dealing with basic administrative uh, 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 rules. And we've done that. We've done that in order to make sure that people get the best possible service. What they want to do, Mr. Speaker, is what they've done before. What they want to do is they want to create a much larger bureaucracy. And, and let's remember the last time the Liberals talked about health reform, what they actually did. What they did is they paid 1,000 nurses to leave the system. They closed 1,500 hospital beds. They took away the administrative help of nurses so that they had less time to spend on the bedside and more time had to be spent on administration. That is the record of the Liberal Party, Mr. Speaker, and now they want to do it again. The Honourable Member for King's West. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll try round two on the same topic, and I can guarantee, and I can guarantee to Premier one thing, that a Liberal government won't have 60,000 patients without a family doctor. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, over the last four years, we have seen a health care system that no longer puts the patient at the centre. Instead, the top heavy administrative structure operating in silos behind administrative and artificial boundaries serves itself, not the patient. Could the minister please explain why his government is so against a health care system that puts the needs of the patients first? The Honourable the Minister of Health and Wellness. M Mr. Speaker, that's so far from the truth. Over the last four years, when we came into government, we had one of the, if not the highest, health administrative costs in the country. Across the country, Mr. Speaker, we're below the national average today. Other jurisdictions are looking at our example and our leadership here in Nova Scotia on how to handle health administrative costs and reduce that and put that money in frontline health care. Not like the Liberal record, Mr. Speaker. We're doing it in a responsible way. The Honourable Member for Kings West on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I can sure 
the minister that nothing has changed in the Annapolis system, just a little bit of restructuring, that's all. People that are no longer on the organizational chart but remain in administration. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, health care in this province is not standardized and uniform across, uh, across the province. Wait times in each district are different. There's too much competition for services and resources, too much administration at the top, and too many silos. We need to have one fully integrated system where the two boards, one for the IWK, one for the province, work together to plan and create one health care system. 943,000 Nova Scotians deserve nothing less. Could the minister please tell Nova Scotians why top-heavy administration is more important to this government than an accessible health care system for patients. Honourable the Minister of Health and Wellness. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think the comments from the Liberal Party are, are quite disrespectful to all the men and women who are dedicated in the communities across the province to ensure that we have good health care and health care delivery, Mr. Speaker. What the Liberal Party is proposing is a Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Super Board. It'd be a Super Bowl of the Close Super enough, Boards, yeah. Mr. Speaker. What they're, what they're suggesting is a super board that will make all those decisions that are being made in communities across this province out of Halifax, Mr. Speaker. We don't want that. We want the engagement of communities because communities are different. Their needs and wants within the health care system is different. And the only way to ensure that their needs are met, Mr. Speaker, is engaging those communities, and it's through the system we have now. We know we need to find so savings within the health administration, Mr. Speaker. We rely on health administrators to help those frontline health care workers. We need them to ensure that they're there and ensuring that they're supporting health care providers, Mr. Speaker. We're we're doing it in the responsible way. I don't know what way they're going to do, Mr. Speaker. They would create ca chaos within the health care system. The Honourable Member for Kings West on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All this minister has to do is ask the people of Inverness, the people of Digby, and the people of Berwick where decisions are being made. Yeah, here, here. Mr. Speaker, one provincial board operating through four regional zones increase site-based management and decision-making by healthcare professionals and enhance responsibilities for community health boards. That's our plan, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have listened to frustrated patients. We have heard from frustrated healthcare professionals who feel their voices have been silenced. It's high time we have in place a government who has a vision to ensure our healthcare system empowers our health care providers. It's high time we have in place a government who has a vision to ensure our health care system serves the patient, not the system itself. Could the minister please tell us why faster wait times and empowered health care workers are not important to the NDP government? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, th and this is a very serious issue. Across the country, governments are trying to harness health care budgets. And we talk, as we meet uh, on a regular basis, ministers from all provinces and territories, liberal ministers, conserv liberal ministers, conservative ministers, and some of the jurisdictions have taken the steps that is proposed by the Liberal, liberal Party, Mr. Speaker, and each and every one of them have told me, do not go there. It does not work. It costs more money. Services and money that should be going to frontline health care are not there because we pay to have a, a larger board, Mr. Speaker, and look at provinces like Alberta that now are, have made that tough decision to try to go to a, a super board, Mr. Speaker, now are reverting back to the system we have, Mr. Speaker. It's wrong to go that route, Mr. Speaker. It's right to go the route we've done. Work with administrators, work with the district health authorities to reduce health administration costs and put that money into frontline health care services. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the evidence is mounting at the UARB that Muskrat Falls is not the lowest cost option for Nova Scotia electricity ratepayers. The evidence that's mounting seriously contradicts the assertions of both the NDP and Nova Scotia Power about that mega project. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the, re the uh, review board's own consultant found, and I quote, that Muskrat Falls has not been demonstrated to be a definitive least cost incremental supply source for our province's energy future. In other words, Mr. Speaker, it costs too much. Uh, will the Premier 
allow the Utility and Review Board to set its own timeline for review of this expensive project so that Nova Scotians can be assured that it's the best way forward by someone other than his government and Nova Scotia Power. Honourable the Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Conservative Party must be, you know, they mu he must be disappointed because the, in fact, the fact of the matter is exactly the opposite is true than what he says. In fact, a number of consultants from the board have been hired, and all of them but one found that this was the best project for Nova Scotia, for ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. They, they, they are um, looking at this project uh, in, uh, in depth as they are supposed to. In fact, Mr. Speaker, this project has, more, has had more scrutiny than any project that has ever come before the utility and review board, at least so far as I know, and I've been around uh, for a while, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the reality is, the reality is that this uh, energy strategy, which includes Muskrat Falls, means that the energy that will be used by Nova Scotians will be uh, local, it will be secure, it will be green, and thanks, Mr. Speaker, to this government, it will be tax-free. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the uh, UARB's own consultant says it's not the lowest cost option. The Consumer Advocates consultant says it's not the lowest cost option. The Small Business Advocate says it's not the lowest cost option. Those are the people who are there at the board representing the ratepayers of Nova Scotia. The only person that has made up his mind, regardless of the cost, is the one that Nova Scotians are supposed to look to to protect them, and that is their premier, but he is closed-minded on Muskrat Falls, Mr. Speaker. That's why he's ordered the board to approve that project within six months and no more. So I will ask the premier, if he truly wants to know if it's best, why not allow the board to do its work in its own time frame? Honourable the Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, 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 I know um, yesterday uh, a member of uh, the, the federal party associated with uh, the leader of the Conservative Party was in town, the Honourable Jim Prentice. He was in town to speak to the, uh, the uh, MEA, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, um, the, uh, the Maritime Energy Association, and I just want to read again because I, I apparently um, the leader of the Conservative Party missed this yesterday. I don't know if he was, uh, uh, I don't know what he was doing. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, I know it gets noisy in here, so perhaps didn't hear. And this is what Mr. Prentice had to say yesterday. When I was in politics, I had the privilege of serving as both the industry minister and the environment minister. These experiences left me with an affinity for the kind of development that helps generate widespread spread and long-term prosperity and is, at the same time, environmentally sustainable. In my view, Lower Churchill is all of this and more. It is a transformational project for Atlantic Canada that will take the region to a new level of industrial development. Mr. Speaker, I think uh, uh, that the, the, uh, the leader of the Conservative Party should uh, heed the words of his former colleague, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think he should understand that this, that this project will deliver the lowest fairest rates for people in Nova Scotia, but more than that, it will help transform the economy of our region, that this is the first uh, of a, a regional, uh, the first of, of the major regional projects among the Atlantic provinces and is important for the welfare of all of us. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Prentice is a fine fellow, but he doesn't have to pay the bills. We do, and that is the whole point. We're the ones, all Nova Scotians, who have to pay for this expensive project. Not just today's Nova Scotians, but it's a 35-year project. A whole other generation of Nova Scotians are going to be asked to pay for that project, and that is the problem. Mr. Speaker, we all want renewable power, we all want a great energy future, but we have to make a decision today that respects 35 years of Nova Scotians. So my point, Mr. Speaker, is we tell our kids to do their homework. On this case, one and a half billion dollars, 35 years, why won't the Premier do his? 
Honorable the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've done my job, and I understand that this is the lowest, fairest rates for Atlantic Canadians, and unfortunately for Nova Scotians, and, and unfortunately the Conservative leader doesn't seem to care about that. Uh, I, you know, there was a short time, uh, a short time ago, when the leader of the Conservative Party was in Ottawa, he was speaking to national uh, organizations, and he was talking about the benefits. Uh, of uh, Muskrat Falls, not just to Nova Scotia, but to all of Atlantic Canada. He was promoting this project as one that was uh, building the uh, country. And he was right then. And he is wrong now. Mr. Speaker, Muskrat Falls will deliver the lowest and fairest uh, rates for Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, has the minister met with citizens in the hillside Trenton area regarding the fly ash emissions from the Trenton power station as the NDP promised, and, and as well as the environmental and health concerns and the promised health study? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, thank you Mr. Speaker. Uh, in the Department of Health, we have, of course, uh, public health. We have uh, Dr. Strang, who leads a team of, of dedicated professionals who try to ensure uh, that there's good public policy, that uh, any issues that arise from communities across the province, doesn't matter where they're at, uh, that they look at it and ensure uh, that uh, people are living in an environment that's healthy uh, for their citizens, for the community, Mr. Speaker. We're, uh, we're committed to that. and. Uh, I know that the, uh, the public health within the division, uh, the public health division, has been working hard uh, to meet the needs of those who request uh, reviews and, and, and look at issues around the province, and I think they'll, they'll continue to do that into the future. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his first supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, since the Minister has trouble answering questions about his schedule, I'll help him. He is not. I have asked his predecessor in 2010, 2011, and 2012 whether she would meet with them, and she said, quote, on uh, April the 5th, 2012, I set my priorities in terms of what needs to be addressed by making those decisions, and she goes on about accommodating people and so forth. So I guess this isn't a priority, which is funny because it was such a priority for NDP members from the Picto ridings when they were in opposition, and they, and they championed having a health study done. And in fact, the environment minister on April 5th, 2011, said that he understood the Department of Health and Wellness was going to undertake a health study on this issue, and yet there's no study that anybody's aware of, and no meeting has yet occurred, despite the fact that this health min or the previous health minister has been through Trenton. So, Mr. Speaker, why is the minister, this minister, continuing his predecessor's position of avoiding this group from Trenton, when in opposition the NDP were so committed to meeting with them? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Th thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The Medical Officer of Health for the province of Nova Scotia is uh, someone who is dedicated, someone who is trained, who is a professional uh, within that field of, of public health, Mr. Speaker. He has met uh, in the past with this uh, organization that the member brings, brings forward. He is, the, I think, the most appropriate person to engage with communities uh, when they have concerns around health health issues, no matter what it is, if it's fly ash, if it's, if it's anything else that uh, is of concern of a community or, or an organization, our public health officer is there to support them, they're there to investigate, they're there to inquire and, and really come forward with any ideas or any changes that need to be uh, had or any warnings. Mr. Speaker. So uh, I have full confidence in the medical officer uh, of health here in Nova Scotia that he's doing his job uh, just as he, he's supposed to, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to continuing to work with him in the coming months. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have no doubt about the qualifications of the province's chief medical officer of health. The issue is the NDP M MLAs from the Pictou area had committed that the health minister would meet. In previous question periods, this minister's predecessor said that she would make every effort to meet with this group. The environment minister stood in this house on the record and said that he understood a health study on the effects of the coal ash was underway through the Department of Health and Wellness. Now this minister is saying, well, it's not up to him to meet with, with this group. Mr. Speaker, 
This, gr this group of people represents a large number of people who have very serious and real concerns about coal ash from the Trenton plant. The Premier stands up time and time again and talks about the evils of coal, and yet now his health minister won't even give the time of day to these people. Mr. Speaker, will this minister meet today with the residents from the Hillside Trenton area? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Th thank you, and I do, I do want to make a correction. It was a, it was a district uh, medical officer who has met with, with groups in that, so I don't want to, I don't want to say anything that are the uh, medical health officer for the whole province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I've been very open with organizations and people around the province. Uh, more than happy if I could facilitate a uh, meeting with anybody uh, today, I will do that. Uh, we take the job seriously to ensure uh, that the people who are working within the Division of Public Health uh, have the training, have the professional background to, to give advice and to move forward any issues or concerns that communities have around the province. We do that. The office, the division, they promote. Uh, you know issues that are going on around the province. So uh, if we can, we can do that, I will uh, more than happy uh, to accommodate that. The Honourable Member for Hans West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government has gone out of their way to make it difficult for small businesses to prosper. Independent power producers learn that lessons the hard way when they enter into competitions run by the Renewable Energy Administrator to supply renewable energy to NSP. Those independent companies lost out to Nova Scotia Power. The UARB says this is a policy matter for the government. My question to the Minister of Energy. Will the Minister examine the process used by Renewable Energy Administrator to ensure small, independent companies have the same opportunities as bids back by Nova Scotia Power. The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Certainly, uh, Nova Scotia is blessed with lots of, uh, lots of wind. In fact, uh, it's estimated we have one of the best wind regimes in all of North America, and we have uh, small wind projects, we have large wind projects, we have the ComFit program for uh, small wind projects in our communities, and that's been very popular, and we have our uh, large wind projects through the, uh, uh, through the uh, Renewable Electricity Administrator, and um, he uh, went through the competitive bidding process. Uh, people knew going in that the minority partnerships were possible, and uh, we've ended up with three projects that are the best uh, possible opportunity uh, on the large wind projects for, for Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Hans West on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Speaker. Last fall, the Renewable Energy Administrator himself was concerned that the bid process would become less competitive if Nova Scotia Power was allowed to win every bid. He argued that the independent power producers might choose not to bid at all when the cards are stacked against them. Even the, minister even the minister must realize the reduced competition for energy contracts means higher bills for ratepayers. Question to the minister, will the minister create a fair bid process that gives independent producers a chance, or will he continue to always favor Nova Scotia Power? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure where the Honourable Member is getting his research from, but in reality, there were 19 applications under the Renewable Electricity Administrator program. Three of those were awarded contracts, and those were the three that had the lowest price for Nova Scotians, somewhere in the 7.5 cent uh, rate uh, per kilowatt hour. And uh, in total, we're going to end up saving approximately $50 million, $50 million for the ratepayers of this province over the lifetime of those projects. Here, here. Good the Honourable Member for Hans West on his final supplementary. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since the Minister is so certain that the process is fair, he should welcome the scrutiny. Unsuccessful bidders are not allowed to appeal the decision. The rules say only Nova Scotia Power can appeal rulings, which is unlikely to happen, when they are both the sellers and the buyers on the contracts in question. This is not fair. We know that, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Minister. Why does the Minister insist on always stacking the cards in favour of Nova Scotia Power? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly going into the bidding process, all the applicants knew the rules. They knew that under the 2010 Renewable Electricity Plan that minority partnerships were allowed. And uh, in fact, it is the best possible deal for ratepayers. $50 million in savings over the lifetime of the project. Here's what the UARB had to say about the uh, uh, process. Said, and I quote, they said, it's a low-risk uh, deal that is a good investment on behalf of the ratepayers of this province. So again, it's uh, the lowest possible, the fairest rates uh, for Nova Scotians in, in this province. 
The Honourable Member for Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the provincial economy stalled last year. GDP increase was 0.2% province-wide. The province assumed a 1.2% GDP growth rate last year and were off the mark by a whole percentage point. So I guess they were turning the corner on accurate estimates, Mr. Speaker. This disappointing result came at a time when the NDP was spending hundreds of millions on corporate giveaways. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Economic and Rural Development explain how, after he spent hundreds of millions in corporate handouts, economic growth still ended up being flat? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. I'm only too happy to stand in my place and talk about uh, what they term as giveaways and what we term as investments. At no time do we give money away, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what we've done and what we will continue to do is we've made sound investments in uh, the Nova Scotia economy, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what we've done, uh, whether it be with Irving, whether it be with, uh, uh, with projects, whether it be with IBM, whether it be with Michelin, whether it be with any of those companies that we've made these investments in, Mr. Speaker, the, the the people that gain from this are Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. By these investments, we get to hire more people. We get more in the way of tax revenue, Mr. Speaker, more money so that we can invest, reinvest in health, in education, in all those things that are of value to Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. These are investments. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rather than corporate giveaways, the Minister needs to focus his efforts on setting a competitive economic playing field for the province. This would allow businesses in the province, large and small, Mr. Speaker, to succeed. Yet, in an effort to get some quick and easy photo ops, the Minister and the government preferred to sign over blank checks to large businesses with no targets or guarantees, Mr. Speaker. 0.2% growth across the province, which is a weighted average. Of course, Halifax is doing well as we hear about the cranes in the sky. So if the 0.2% was our entire GDP growth, what does rural Nova Scotia look like in terms of economic growth, Mr. Speaker? So why does the Minister think that photo ops and marketing slogans are more important than economic fundamentals? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, uh, we make sound investments, strategic investments uh, for, for Nova Scotia. Uh, we've made uh, sound investments uh, all over the problems of Nova Scotia, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, including Southwest Nova, including uh, the island of Cape Britain, Mr. Speaker, is we continue to make those investments, and those investments are paying off. We are... We are on the verge of the greatest economic boom that in my lifetime, in our entire lifetime, Mr. Speaker. Maritime Link, uh, when we think of the enormous benefits that will be just to Cape Britain in itself, uh, Mr. Speaker. When we think, when we think Mr. Speaker, uh, about uh, uh, IBM and projects uh, coming, these are investments that these companies otherwise would not be locating or relocating here to the province of Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, as I, as I said a number of times, Mr. Speaker, instead of the East going West, under our watch, Mr. Speaker, the West is coming East. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, businesses and consumers have lost confidence in this government's ability to manage our economy. And it's no wonder, Mr. Speaker, a stalled provincial economy, 0.2% growth, a rural recession, and double-digit unemployment rates across the province, and as we've heard many times, 18.6, an alarming 18.6 in Cape Breton. So, Mr. Speaker, the Minister talks about sound investments. With, with that much, $600 million of sound investments does not result in 0.2% GDP growth. Meanwhile, the Minister is more interested in picking winners and losers and issuing press releases and getting quick and easy photo ops. So my question, when will the Minister start putting the needs of Nova Scotian businesses first and get back to creating an economic environment where all Nova Scotian businesses can succeed? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what I'd like the member opposite to understand is that our investments are, are very, very accommodating. Uh, we don't have blanket investments. We've made huge investments in small business in the province of Nova Scotia, uh, Mr. Speaker, by, by streamlining uh, process, by eliminating red tape. Mr. Speaker, uh, under our watch, we've had 400 400 companies that have benefited from the investments that we've made. Mr. Speaker, we've had 10,000 Nova Scotian employees that have benefited by the PIP, by our investment in them, Mr. Speaker. We've had, uh, I've, I've had invites uh, uh, for a stream in uh, Glace Bay, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, when I visited them, uh, giving me a tour, and very, very grateful and thankful uh, for the efforts of this government, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what we hear from Chamber of Commerce Commerces. Chamber of Commerce is not just here in Halifax, but also in Cape Britain, Mr. Speaker, where they say, stay focused, you're on the right track, and stay there. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, this week the Premier committed to an Atlantic Workforce Partnership that will standardize apprenticeship programs between the Atlantic provinces. Mr. Speaker, on December 8, 2011, his department launched a review of the apprenticeship program. Then, on January 15, 2013, the department launched a new review of the uh, apprenticeship program. So. Mr. Speaker, this government is dragging its feet on making changes to the apprenticeship program and on getting our own workforce trained for projects like the federal shipbuilding contract with Irving. So my question to you, to the Minister, when will the Minister finally release the findings of the Apprenticeship Review Report and get on with taking action? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, we are working uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the private sector, the unionized workers, the merit uh, uh, employers, Mr. Speaker. We're working with everybody, Mr. Speaker. What we're not doing, Mr. Speaker, is, is, is stopping growth in that area where, where people can, can get actually get work. We're not cutting down jobs in Cape Breton, Mr. Speaker, and, and getting rid of the Veterans Affairs, Mr. Speaker, get, getting, getting rid of, of, of people that work for Service Canada, Mr. Speaker, where we go to for some of our training. Mr. Speaker, instead of that, the, the federal government is, is poking around trying to get rid of the LMAs, Mr. Speaker. We, he should be here supporting us and fighting with Nova Scotians, fighting with the Tory Premier from, from Newfoundland, the Tory... Uh, uh, Premier from New Brunswick, the Liberal. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, you know what? I'll sit down because I just feel sorry for that lot. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes on his first supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and this caucus feels sorry for the people that are out west that want to come back home. Yeah, to Mr. Speaker, the minister and the former minister refused to look at increasing the apprenticeship to journey person ratio. This is something Newfoundland has done successfully. Newfoundland and Labrador also has an agreement in place with Alberta that allows apprentices from Newfoundland to accumulate work experience in Alberta, something the NDP cancelled here. Since we are now taking a regional pro approach to apprenticeship, Mr. Speaker, Will the minister adopt the programs Newfoundland has put in place for its apprenticeship programs? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, it, it's interesting that they, they, every question over there follows the flawed logic of their leader, Mr. Speaker. That's just not true. We, we have working agreements with the province of, of Alberta. But, Mr. Speaker, what we're trying to do, we're trying, we're tr as opposed to what they would want to do, Mr. Speaker, they may not want to hear this, but the, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we have workers and employers working together with, with academics to find out which works best for our apprentices, Mr. Speaker. They don't want to do that. They want to be the top downs, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing is we're building us. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the man is, 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 the member over there is quite upset about getting it done. Mr. Speaker, more, than, more, more importantly than getting it done, we're going to get it done, and we're going to get it done right. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. 
on his final supplementary. We're, we're, we're just waiting for when, because the government is delaying the apprenticeship review, Mr. Speaker. It's stalling on changing the ratio. And who can forget the backdoor union drive they created last year by forcing Nova Scotia apprentices to sign a union card in order to gain valuable work experience in Alberta? We all want appre apprentices to stay here and learn their trade here. And that's why we think it's time for the, for the government to finally take action to make that happen. So my question to the minister, when will the government put the employment futures of young Nova Scotians ahead of the demands of special interest friends and implement the programs Newfoundland has successfully put in place? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, we're, we're, the two members are asking the same question, Mr. Speaker. So, well, uh, you know, uh, neither one makes sense. But, Mr. Speaker, we have, we have never... Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. There have been no changes. You know, they, they, they're, you know, I don't know what planet that group lives on, Mr. Speaker, but there's been no changes, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we, we have allowed workers to, to freely move from, uh, from Newfoundland or whether from Prince Edward Island or whether from Alberta. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is, is he just wants us to hold his bolus, take, take, take somebody else along. What we want to do is things, but the leadership of our Premier, we've met at CAP this week and, we, and we're all working together. We're all, uh, a system that that party doesn't understand, Mr. Speaker. We are working together. Apprentices will be trained here. They'll be working here, Mr. Speaker, and they'll be able to travel all across this country, not limited by like that group did, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This government's recently announced its early years initiative. The announcement was typical of this government, grand photo ops and no details. The government's April 10th release states that the initiative will, and I quote, help bring seamless access to regulated child care, early learning programs, early intervention, and parent education. So, Mr. Speaker, the only thing that is impeding any access to those services is this government's chronic underfunding of the organizations that deliver them. So my question to the minister. Will the minister tell members of this House how much the government is investing in early intervention programs, those very programs that provide family-based services to our youngest? The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We continue to invest in our uh, early intervention programs, and I'm looking forward to working with the working group uh, that we are going to be forming so we can be looking at uh, all aspects of our early years in terms of their wages, accessibility, and affordability. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester North on her first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question was how much. The answer is $2.9 million to 23 agencies serving 900 families. And, Mr. Speaker, imagine, I wouldn't clap about it, imagine the surprise when the government announced an early year's intervention with a focus on intervention without properly funding that. So my question to the minister is this. Will the minister commit to putting her words into action and increase the funding for early intervention in this province? The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What we have done as a government that no other government has done, we've recognized the importance of the early years by creating a department within the Department of Education, uh, Early Ch uh, Childhood Development uh, Department. We are in a process of bringing all of our services from uh, community services and health and wellness into one department so that we can look at our children from birth to age six so we can make sure that we're supporting our families and our children appropriately. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester North on her final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the present time, there are 200 families across this province who are on a wait list waiting for access to early intervention programs. And some of these families, Mr. Speaker, will have to do without the supports as their children age out of the program before they start school. Early, interventions and early interventionists and families are begging for more, resource more resources to serve their children and to address the wait list. So my question to the minister, what will it take for her NDP government to make kids a priority in this province and increase funding for early intervention? 
The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And our young children and children that need earlier intervention are a priority of our government, and we are funding the programs. It is part of our budget uh, process, and we, have, we are making sure that we are going to be looking at our children through our new department in a seamless manner to make sure that our children are getting the services they need across the province, province equitably. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester North on a new question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we know that it is the McCain Foundation that is funding the Early Learning Initiative in this province, and we congratulate and thank them for their commitment. So my question to the Minister is this. Why did the Minister fail to acknowledge publicly that the Early Learning Initiative in this province is being funded by the McCain Foundation and not the Department of Education? The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, uh, the McCain Foundation have been instrumental uh, in the development of the work that we are doing here in the province. They were acknowledged publicly. They are, we are working in partnership with them. They are, they are contributing to our early years uh, centres. Uh, along with the, our, it's, it's a partnership. It is definitely a partnership and they were acknowledged. And I will say again, we really appreciate the leadership that the McCain Foundation has provided the Department of Education. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester North on her first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, significant contrib contribution from the McCain Foundation was not acknowledged in the throne speech. It was not acknowledged in the ministerial statement on the day of the announcement. It was not acknowledged in the press release on the day of the announcement. And I will table those documents so the minister can read them. The government's only commitment to the initiative is $1.2 million for the province-wide implementation of this. Educators and parents recognize that this is not adequate. So will the minister admit that without the McCain Foundation funding, the early learning initiative would be one more program for kids that is underfunded in this province. The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Uh, thank you very much. I would just like to say that the early uh, years, our sites that we are setting up, the three of them in the province, uh, our budget included $450,000 for that and $100,000 uh, $100, of that will be from the McCain Foundation. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Preston. Mr. Speaker, the 2002 Dorsey Report on Workers' Compensation made a recommendation about benefits saying, quote, over time, increases to the index and in benefits from 50% to 100% of the consumer price index, end of quote, and I will table that. Uh, the Pictou County Injured Workers Association has been working to have these changes made to ensure that the injured workers are not forced into poverty. They are calling on the government to implement the full indexing of compensation benefits as per the Dorsey recommendations. My question is to the Minister responsible for the Workers' Compensation Board. Mr. Speaker, why has this government done nothing with respect to this recommendation? Minister responsible for the Workers' Compensation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can say to that member, we inherited a mess with WCB, and it was all thanks to those guys in 99 and 96. Thank you. The Honourable member for Preston on his first supplementary. In other words, the minister is going to do nothing. Right. Workers who were injured before 1990 were high hopes that the NDP would change legislation to ensure that all injured workers would be treated fairly. Injured workers are feeling ignored by this government. Will the minister tell those injured workers who were hurt before 1990 if they can expect to get treated equally by this NDP government and receive workers' compensation benefits? The Honourable Minister responsible for the Workers' Compensation Board. Mr. Speaker, I should probably introduce that member to Jay Abbas, the former Minister of, 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 of Labour, that, that put those onerous rules on it. Maybe the, minister, maybe the member can read the, the, the Hayden decision, Mr. Speaker, as he was a member of that former Liberal government and decide what they've done, Mr. Speaker. That's what caused that stuff, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's the hypocritical position of the Liberal Party and what they did to injure workers in this province. It's not this government. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston on his final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, it seems that this government can only blame things on every other government around, everybody else around, 
They've been in government for four years, four years, and have done nothing except ruin the economy. Since NDP took office, power rates have gone up by 30 percent. Fuel costs are skyrocketing, taxes have increased, and people are finding it harder to make ends meet. Injured workers are a particularly difficult time because this government is more focused on penalizing employers through penalties rather than supporting work, workplaces and workers. It seems that this NDP has changed their stripes when it comes to protecting workers. Will the minister tell injured workers today, injured workers today, when they can expect any action from this government? The Honourable Minister responsible for the Workers' Compensation Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, I stand in my place as, as a proud person who represents many workers, Mr. Speaker, and I haven't changed any stripes, Mr. Speaker. When it, took, when, it came, when it came to automatic assumption, the former Minister of Labour passed a bill in here to protect coal miners, Mr. Speaker. That's action, Mr. Speaker. A couple of weeks ago, there was a bill in front of this House on protecting widows, Mr. Speaker. That's action. Action that was ignored by that lot, Mr. Speaker. We take action. We don't change stripes, Mr. Speaker. We do it. Honourable Member for Halifax, Clayton Park. Thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Service, Nova Scotia, Municipal Relations. As the Minister knows, Mr. Speaker, my area has over 9,000 apartment units in the Clayton Park riding, and a lot of those are small one-bedroom apartments, and people are very careful with their usage of, of uh, energy often in those small apartments. And my question relates to the heating assistance rebate program, which when the NDP came to power in 2009, they cut from $450 per recipient down to a maximum of $200. Well, I have the, the form. There is no $450 uh, rebate anymore. So a new program. The minister can say he didn't do it, but this program maximizes at $200. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, the point of this is that not only is there an income threshold to the, to the access to this rebate, there is also an energy usage threshold. And if you don't, it says very clearly, and I'll table this from the website, government website, it says that you have to show you used at least 6,000 kilowatt hours of electricity in a 12-month period to get any rebate. Mr. Speaker, my question to the minister is exactly why they have a rebate uh, threshold uh, for usage when many low-income Nova Scotians are keeping the heat low in order to, to just manage. And I want to know why that's there. The Honourable Minister of Service Nova Scotia and Municipal Relations. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite uh, for the question. And it actually, it's a good question. Uh, the uh, when we came into power, uh, the threshold was 18,000 uh, kilowatts. Uh, we reduced it to 10, then we reduced it to six. Uh, the I guess it would come down to, like lots of priorities and decisions um, that uh, the governments have to make, that at some point, you know, you only have so much money for any particular program, so that we actually increased the, the number of people who could qualify by reducing from 18,000 kilowatts down to 6,000 uh, kilowatts, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and I would say that, yes, maybe we could say you don't have to show any evidence of what power that you, you used, but we didn't want to be given a rebate if somebody used a hair dryer, Mr. Speaker. We wanted to make sure that they were actually heating their apartment or heating their, heating their home. So that really is the thinking behind it. At some point in the future, if government is able to take a look at that, I think, I think we would be glad to do that. But uh, we also offer uh, money to the Salvation Army. Uh, to help people in, in need as well. And uh, so we're, it, we'd always be interested in looking, but at some point, if the, if the member has an interest in, in lowering that, then I have to ask her, what is it you, you'd like us to cut in order to do that, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Member for Halifax, Clayton Park, on her first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's simply backward thinking to cut the very, very poorest people out of this rebate program. It's backward. The people living in small apartments who are keeping their temperature as low as possible and using as little energy as possible because they simply don't have the money to pay those bills. 
and they will have bills that are ab above the $200 that the, the minister is referring to as the threshold. I think it's not a way of making money. We're not suggesting it, it's a way to get money when you didn't spend it. It's a rebate program. The maximum would be what you had spent on your, on your power up to a $200 limit, which is already too small for many low-income people. It isn't even enough for people getting oil to have a, have a delivery for $200. Mr. Speaker, the minister, I, I think, should review what he's saying. Perhaps in his answer to me, he will. I'm saying there's very few people that this would, quali that this would affect, but they are the most vulnerable, the people that are, are really living in, in a a very stark way. I've heard from these people in my riding, Mr. Speaker. They're people who are, have very little income and are keeping the temperature really low because they simply can't afford it. And they're the ones who are being kept out, of, Mr. Speaker, of the rebate program. I know it's May 1st. I know the weather's warmed up. But now's the time to think about how this program could be better next year. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the minister is, I'd like him to, to uh, endeavor to tell me how many people may be affected by this, by this threshold, by the usage thresh, th threshold, and I'd like a commitment for him to reconsider that it be taken off. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia Municipal Relations. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not opposed to reconsidering anything. I, I'd be glad to reconsider this uh, going into next year. The, uh, the member asked how many people that I think this might affect. I, I think that at every point when the government looked at setting the level, they always said that this, this will get the, the most of the people. Then they reduced it to 10,000 kilowatts from 18, thinking this would catch most of the people. Then we reduced it from 10 to 6, thinking this would catch most of the people. So I have to say that for, for complaints otherwise, that someone who actually contacts my department to say you have to lower this or they don't, and we look at those cases individually, we can help. I, I generally tell my staff, do, do something for this person. The, there are very few, extremely few. I'm thinking two, maybe three. The one thing I want to, the one thing I want to remind the member opposite is that we pay the HST on people's electrical bills in this province, something that turns out to be 10% of their electrical bill, which helps these people as well, something that her party voted against, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, we, if we read the Herald this morning, we would read about a, uh, a letter from Jonathan Rosenthal. And in that, he commented on the delays in the Fenwick McIntosh case as being outrageous and they remain virtually unexplained. Now, last week, Mr. Speaker, the Premier said that he had asked the federal government to participate and to do the right thing in calling the inquiry. Does the minister believe that an inquiry must be done by the federal government, or is he just passing the buck? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to just advise the, the uh, member and thank him for the question. Uh, but as er early as this morning, I met with my staff and, uh, and discussed this very issue further. And we're still uh, looking when we get an interim report from the Department of Public Prosecutions to get a little bit of an update there. We should be getting the RCMP report within a week or so. Once I get that information, I think it's very critical in this matter that we acknowledge the abuse uh, to individuals that have made those allegations. We're sensitive to that. We're caring about that. I, too, share the same uh, concern that the member does in getting to understand the complexity of this issue and how this happened and what we can do to ensure that it doesn't happen in the future. But in the interim, I really need to get the overall picture to understand because such a historical context in this matter is required to be understood. The Honourable Member for Inverness on well, his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to make the point, Mr. Speaker, that the federal government did address the problem, and the Premier acknowledged that in, in earlier this uh, or last week that uh, when the federal government was returning, returned this predator back to Nova Scotia. Now, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate what the minister is saying here, but I think we on all sides of this house want to find out what went wrong. And we believe that this minister and his department do know what went wrong internally. They have access to that. And my question to the minister is why won't the minister call an independent inquiry now to get answers for the victims of these horrible crimes? 
The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, and thank you to the member. I just would like to explain to him a, a couple of things on the structure of our justice system in Nova Scotia. The public prosecutions is an independent unit under its own direction with, their own, with its own director. That director has taken it upon himself to do a review so that he understands what's occurred within the public prosecutions. At the same time, the RCMP is another branch of the justice system uh, providing service within this province. They, in fact, as well as doing a review. It's so responsible on my part, then, is to collect this information. In the interim, I am gathering additional information on the historical relationship between this matter. And uh, I don't want any Nova Scotian out there to be confused. I am committed to trying to find out and understand how this could occur. And uh, so it's a matter of being well informed before I make a decision. I will not react in an inappropriate manner. I will be informed and will react accordingly. The Honourable Member for Inverness on his final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can appreciate that uh, this matter, and we know how long it's dragged on, and, and the, the whole reason that it, it was not productive in facing the... The whole reason the justices were not able to, to uh, address this matter is because... Uh, and, Mr. Speaker, I apologize. I think my blood sugar is a little low. I'm having difficulty concentrating, but... Uh, and I'm actually serious, but uh, I want to make the point that... Um, that people have been waiting a long time, and I want to make that point to the minister, that uh, people are hoping that this will, that the, this minister will make sure that this happens quickly, and that he honestly look at an independent inquiry. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question for the minister is that I hope that we can, my question once again for the minister, will he look, when will he look at doing an independent review? The Honourable Minister of Justice. As I stated in my earlier part of my answer, it's very important that as the public prosecutions it is an independent body at arm's length from, uh, from this, this house here, that I do get the information from them, that I get the information from the police. And then we look at what's the best way to approach the concerns and the issues that are outlined there. There is an issue in this whole process about, uh, about the renewing of the warrants, which we've raised with the federal government. We'll continue to do that. Uh, people waiting a long time, I understand that, and I think all Nova Scotians deserve an answer. And when I have the appropriate information to make an informed decision, I will make one. And we're hoping that sooner than later. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you. Um... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is, I, I guess, for the Minister of Energy. Um, earlier in question period today, the Premier talked about there being all these studies tabled in the Maritime Link hearings in favour of, uh, favor of the Maritime Link thing. It's the lowest cost. The Minister of Energy yesterday said that 9 of 14 studies that were tabled, in fact, said that. And I will table his comments from yesterday. In fact, Mr. Speaker, he was only right about one thing and that's that there were uh, 14 studies tabled, and I'll table that, the list of the 14 studies. Mr. Speaker, of those 14 studies, in fact, only one of them says that the maritime link is the lowest and cheapest cost, and I will table all 14 studies, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. So that maybe the minister, here, there you go, because maybe the minister will take some time to read them, two of them. Two of them offer no comment as they weren't asked to look on that. Two of them look only at whether the, the project is technically possible, which everybody agrees it is. One is against the project because it says it violates Aboriginal rights. And all of the remaining studies say that the Enerco study says the costs are underestimated. The Woolridge study says Amir is proposing a level of profit double what it should be and will gouge ratepayers. The Booth evidence says Amir is making too much money on the project. And the Anatex, Synapse, Leviton, Canwe, and LPRA evidence all say Amir overestimated fuel costs to make the project look better and the other options worse for ratepayers. So, Mr. Speaker, would the minister please explain why he's misrepresenting the evidence filed at the Utility and Review Board? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, there's a lot of evidence, obviously, as the Honourable Member is tabling some of it. And, uh, you know, it, uh, again, I'll stick to my uh, understanding. There's about nine that were pro and five that were con in, the, in these connect connections. But, you know, it all depends on your interpretation of how you read the evidence, I guess. And really, the role of the UARB is, is to determine what is the evidence, what is the best information. 
and they have to test the evidence, they have to review the intervener's uh, evidence, and they have to cross-examine everything that's there. So that is the role of the UARB, to look at all that evidence, determine what, uh, what is right and what is fair. Is it the, right, the best deal for, uh, for Nova Scotians? The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East on his first supplementary. No, Mr. Speaker, I really do hope the Minister will take the time to read the 14 studies I tabled, which included his Dalton study, because only one only one of them actually said it's the lowest and fairest cost. Even if you include the two that don't talk about cost and say that the project is technically possible, and that's the only thing they looked at, you still only have three studies that say that that project are in favor of that project. Mr. Speaker, the minister should stop representing the facts. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the premier, the premier was saying that because the repeat recipient of the Fossil of the Day Award, Mr. Jim Prentice, said the Muskrat Falls is a good deal. It must be. Well, my goodness, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the Premier is also aware that many financial magazines are, are look, have speculated that CIBC, where Mr. Prentice works, is trying to actually get some of the loans and investments for that project. Mr. Speaker, if the Minister truly believes if the minister truly believes that the evidence will support the deal currently proposed by Amira for Muskrat Falls, rather than made in Nova Scotia solutions, then why won't he extend the hearing? Mr. Speaker, the Premier and Minister may wish to put Newfoundland first. We want to put Nova Scotia first. Mr. Speaker, is the minister concerned that by giving the review board the time it takes to make a decision, it will become crystal clear that this deal is structured against Nova Scotians. Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, obviously, we b firmly believe that the Muskrat Falls the Maritime Lake is the best deal for, for Nova Scotians and will provide stable rates for 35 years. But since uh, this uh, spring session, maybe the fall session, maybe the spring before that, I've been trying to figure out what is the Liberal uh, uh, policy on energy. And, you know, I know they want to put the, uh, they want to put the HST back on home energy. They want to eliminate efficiency in Nova Scotia. Uh, that'll cost uh, over $100 million. They want to deregulate electricity, 30 to 50% increase in the rates. And they want to cozy up to Hydro-Quebec. So what is the real um, energy uh, policy for the Liberal Party? The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. You know, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it's this government's own Minister of Health that wrote a column suggesting we should get energy from Hydro-Quebec, so I'm not sure why he's criticizing us about that. Mr. Speaker, the Premier stood in this House and said that, the, that this project would allow us to get more energy from Hydro-Quebec, yet they're criticizing us for repeating what the Premier said. Mr. Speaker, yesterday on News 95.7, the Minister stated there would be thousands of jobs, thousands of jobs from the Maritime Link. Maybe but not in Nova Scotia. And of course, he forgets, the, he forgets to mention the jobs that will be lost at Lingan and that Nova Scotia has already ha come to acknowledge. Guess the government doesn't think the unemployment rate in Cape Breton is high enough. Mr. Speaker, so they believe, the NDP believes that a few temporary construction jobs is better than a made in Nova Scotia solution of renewable energy with long-term investment and long-term jobs here. So Mr. Speaker, why does the NDP believe that short-term construction jobs, few of which will be in Nova Scotia, are better than the permanent jobs and investment that will come with made in Nova Scotia alternatives of renewable energy that almost all those studies endorse? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, the Lower Churchill Maritime Link will provide the lowest fares energy rates for Nova Scotians, but I'm still trying to figure out what the, uh, the, what the Liberal policy is on energy. I went to the Liberal website to try to find out. Here I have a copy of it. And one day they're up and one day they're down. But one day uh, the leader of the Liberal Party said that the Lower Churchill is crucial to Nova Scotia's energy future. Another day... The Liberal leader says it's a bad deal for Nova Scotians, but a great for Emeris. Now, the leader, the uh, honourable member for uh, uh, Dartmouth East, said the premier must ensure ratepayers are protected in the Lower Churchill deal. And again, the, the leader of the Liberal Party is saying the energy minister position in Lower Churchill is uh, is not going to work for Nova Scotians. So it's very, very difficult to figure out where they're at. Are they for the project? Or are they against the project? Are they supporting uh, Hydro-Quebec or are they supporting Nova Scotians? I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last year the economy of Nova Scotia stalled. In fact, in rural Nova Scotia, the economy contracted. 
Labor income growth was a slower pace than was observed during the recession, and retail sales were the slowest in four years. Mr. Speaker, this year the government fully expects that there will be 1,100 fewer Nova Scotians employed. This is, uh, there is already double-digit unemployment across the province, and Nova Scotia had the biggest dive in business opposition, optimism of any province in April. Mr. Speaker, with these facts in front of him, does the Minister of Economic and Rural Development still believe there is going to be a surge in personal income tax? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will ask the Minister of Finance to respond to that. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when we put the budget estimates together this year, we do what is done every year, Mr. Speaker. We put, put the forecast together, the assumptions, we test them with economists in all of the major finance, financial institutions in the country, the Conference Board of Canada, the um, Atlantic Provinces Economic Council, economists that are academics in our universities, and then we submit all of that to the Auditor General. And Mr. Speaker, all of that process resulted in the conclusion and the consensus among those folks that the economic estimates of the province were reasonable, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The unemployment rate in Nova Scotia is now 9.5 percent, and as we know, with Halifax weighing down that average, it's extremely high in most rural areas. Unemployment has increased in every region of this province since 2009. 0.2% growth is a clear indication that rural economies are shrinking, Mr. Speaker. Businesses state that, the energy, that energy is the number one cost pressure, increasing 30% in the last three years. Business confidence is the very worst of any province in this country, Mr. Speaker. They are undisputed facts. I don't think any member of the government can say that anything that I just offered is incorrect. With the economic realities in Nova Scotia, how can the minister suggest that our province provides a sound environment for entrepreneurs? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with the investments that we made and uh, the proof when, uh, when we signed uh, agreements uh, with, uh, uh, with Michelin, uh, uh, with uh, BlackBerry, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, with, uh, with projects, uh, uh, with all these companies, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, it, the list goes on and on and on. And do you know what, uh, Mr. Speaker, there are still more to come. We reduced the small business tax, uh, tax Mr. Speaker, three years in a row. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, we, we are helping small businesses, Mr. Speaker. We've, uh, we've included the, the, uh, the web portal uh, we, so we can streamline and make things more efficient and quicker, reduce red tape for small businesses that are seeking all the programs that we offer. Cut to the chase, Mr. Speaker. We, they are investing in us. We have still have, and the, and the member wouldn't know this, and, uh, but uh, we have companies coming from all over the world coming to Nova Scotia, we sat down, we talked to them, and we tried to accommodate in the best interests of Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the province's five-year paving plan was announced uh, to address issues across Nova Scotia and to make certain a strategy was in place for paving and chip sealing. In the past, I've spoken to the former Minister of Transportation and now the current Minister and have put the concerns in writing to the current Minister. And those concerns are concerns of Nova Scotians about paving in subdivisions. And I want to acknowledge I did receive a written response back from the Minister. I appreciate that and I thank you for that. My question to the Minister is this. Will the Minister commit to meeting with municipal leaders as part of that discussion? 
The Honorable Minister of Transportation, Infrastructure, Renewal. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for uh, the question. Uh, as she's indicated, we have had some discussions about this, and we've actually exchanged correspondence. Uh, I'll meet with anyone who has a concern about their roads if they want to meet with me to discuss them, and I intend to... I, I guess it'll be on a first-come, first-serve basis. Uh, in, in, in reference to this particular issue, um, again, uh, it's, it's a, a situation where um, we are prepared to work with, with uh, uh, people who have these J-class roads, municipalities who have these J-class roads, uh, but of course it's, it's a 50-50 shared uh, uh, investment, and if they want to come forward, we'll certainly look at their concerns. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester North on her first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the expensive costs and priority placed on paving and repaving the 100 series highways, as yeah. well as the routes and trunks in Nova Scotia, with that, uh, with those added costs every year, subdivisions have become less of a priority, and they very rarely make it to that list. Many of those roads are identified, but there is never any funding for those, and thus the need for some plan to address those. Uh, so my question to the minister is this. Rather than waiting for municipalities to come to him, will he take the lead and go to the municipalities? The Honourable Minister of Transportation, Infrastructure, Renewal. Uh, thank you uh, again, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, uh, I, I suppose uh, the answer to that question is, I'm available. Uh, I, I don't know in particular which municipalities want to discuss this issue with me. If, if they want to get in touch, I'm, I, I'm not trying to avoid getting in touch with anyone, but I don't know in particular until they come forward with their issue uh, which municipalities uh, would want that kind of attention. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know Nova Scotia's economy is suffering. High unemployment, business closures, and shrinking opportunities make that very clear. Now we've learned that even those who have gone elsewhere for training and education are being turned away when they return home. Many working in trades have been told they're overqualified. Those people are unemployed. Despite their hard work, they're in the same position as 47,600 other Nova Scotians. So my question through you to the Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism, what does the Minister say to the people who are trying to call their province home again but are overqualified? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I welcome the, uh, that question because, first of all, I, I want to say as a, as a partitioner of diversity, and uh, maybe not all members in the House will understand this, but there's no such thing as being overqualified for a job. Uh, the, uh, there are minimum qualifications for a job, and if you're qualified, you're qualified. Uh, that's, that's where it should end. And you know what, uh, Mr. Speaker, not, again, not all members may not understand that, and I would certainly, I, I, I would certainly, I would certainly welcome uh, uh, for those members that, that, that don't quite grasp that uh, to come to me in her time, and I will, I will try uh, my darndest to explain what, uh, what is meant by that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes on his first supplementary. You know, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia doesn't have the capacity for these highly trained workers. More than 18,000 people left our province in 2012. And now we're telling them that our economy is too weak to welcome them home. The message they're sent, we're sending to young people is not inspiring, Mr. Speaker. Nova Scotians want to be here. We should be able to offer them the same opportunities they have elsewhere. And we should never turn them away because they have succeeded. So my question to the minister, when will the minister finally address the problems in our economy and put Nova Scotia in a position to welcome growth and skilled labour? The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's quite obvious uh, that this government has welcomed growth, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've, uh, the, the things that we've done when, uh, when we stand here, or certainly when I stand at my place, and I talk about those strategic investments that we, that we have made so that companies can grow, where new companies can come here, which uh, members from the opposite parties have criticized or spoke against, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, Mr. Speaker, we made that investment uh, in uh, Port Hawkesbury New Page, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 1,400 jobs associated with that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, nobody on this side of the House disagreed with that, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, members on the opposite side of the House disagreed with that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when we make those investments uh, regarding 10,000 employees, current employees, so that they can improve upon their skills, Mr. Speaker, that's investment, that's investment in Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are making strategic investments, and we will continue to do so. The Honourable Member for Victoria de Lakes on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, the expensive policies of this government have had entirely negative impacts on business development in this province. The NDP have shown no desire to keep our young people from going west to find good jobs. They either can't find a job here or they're too qualified for a job here. That's not a very inspiring message for future generations. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to you, to the Minister, when will the Minister turn what looks like a have-not province and do what needs to be done to make it a have province for future generations. The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We did that three years ago when we were elected, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to do it, Mr. Speaker. We are improving the economy. We are including, we are improving the opportunities for Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Glakes Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm just wondering if I could uh, ask a question to the Deputy Premier. Will he support the CBRM Capital Plan? Honourable the Deputy Premier. Yes, we have, Mr. Speaker. The time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. I will now recognize the host leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Oh. Sorry, we're having a little fight over here. Oh, who's speaking first? Uh, Mr. Speaker, can you call Bill number 64? Bill number 64. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, am delighted to rise and speak in support of Bill 64, which in basic terms is a bill to allow the UARB, the review board, to do the job that it's always been able to do in the past, which is to hold hearings on behalf of ratepayers and take the time they need and set their own timeline to review all the evidence and then make a decision that's in the best interest of electricity ratepayers of Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, 